Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Braulio Dumba, uh, a staff research scientist at IBM Research. Hi, all. I'm Guar Rubambiza, um, a postdoctoral associate at Cornell University. Yeah, welcome to this talk uh, titled uh, Experience in, in Designing and Implementing a Cloud Native Framework for digi Digital for Farm Data Analytics. In, in this talk, we are going to share our experience in using cloud native technologies uh, for digital agriculture. Uh, this work is, is a collaboration between uh, IBM Research and the Cornell University. And I'll start with this talk by, by providing the motivation for this work uh, and pro provide, discuss some challenge and uh, provide with some background. Uh, then I'll hand over to Gloa, who will present our framework for digital agriculture and discuss uh, some experimental results. Uh, lastly, uh, I'll conclude the, uh, this talk and, and discuss uh, some next steps. Uh, let me start with some motivation. Uh, digital agriculture is the source of, of the world's food supply, and it, and it accounts for about 4% uh, of global GDP. And, and today, fast population growth and the constant environmental changes are placing substantial pressure on the finite uh, agricultural resources uh, that we have. And the digital agriculture is, is a tool that can help us to address this challenge. Uh, broadly speaking, digital agriculture is, is the use of data-driven techniques to collect, process, and analyze uh, farm data. It can help farmers to, to make better decisions about planting, irrigation, pest control, by providing real-time data on soil quality, crop health, and, and weather patterns. And, the, and this can help to improve uh, farm yields and the efficiency. Uh, in this work, we are bringing cloud-native te technologies to digital agriculture. And we, we have been collaborating with Pro Professor uh, Hakim Weatherspoon from Cornell University. And, um, and his uh, past student, he here present with me, Gloa and also Professor Kate Gold and team. And our team has extensive, extensive experience in conducting research in digital agriculture and also experience on the field. And as we can see in this picture, uh, on the first picture we see, we see here Gloa, my co-presenter, uh, in 2018 at the Cornell uh, University field trying to collect some drone data. And the picture in the middle is, is a corn box that is the field that is used for public uh, agriculture education at Cornell. And, and the, the last picture is, is in California last summer that is, a, is, a, is in a vineyard that is used to, uh, to collect and, and investigate techniques for vineyard disease uh, detention, detection. In this work, uh, we used uh, a, a, co a commercial dairy farm at Cornell University. The farm is used to conduct research in digital agriculture, and it consists of 150,000 cows uh, with the sensors to collect daily data about the cow. For example, collects about the cow age, uh, the water intake, uh, the bad weight, uh, and the others. And to collect this data, we are using uh, several sensors, uh, like for example, the silent herdsman. In this picture, it is the, uh, the device uh, uh, mounted on, on the neck of the cow, and, and it's used to, the, to detect uh, health problems based on the cow uh, activity, uh, rumination, and the eating patterns. On the table there, he also illustrated uh, the, the data, the variety of data that, that we collect for each cow, as well as the, the, the different data source and the frequency uh, of uh, of data collection for each uh, data source. And we have, we have been collecting 10,000 10, of gigabytes of data for, for, the last, for the past 17 months. To, to, to analyze this, this data, we, we, we created a platform uh, to process the, the, the collect daily data. Uh, the data collected is stored uh, in a Cassandra DB. And, and this data is used to, to train an uh, AI model that, that can help to predict the health, health status of cows and the uh, possible uh, disorders. 
uh, then these models I use uh, every day to, to, uh, to predict the health status of the cow. And, and, and the, the, uh, the prediction is done using the data collect uh, for the last 24 hours. And the set of cows identified as, as sick um, are then manually checked by researchers and the uh, clinical examinations are performed in them. The, the cows that uh, were identified as sick but not supported by clinical examination uh, are then uh, follow, uh, close, follow, close followed over time. Uh, but the set of, of cows uh, that were confirmed to have wrong classification, then the data is used to retrain uh, the, AI, the AI model to improve their accuracy. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have been running the, this, this platform uh, for the last 17 months. And this system has matured enough uh, that we, we, we decide to, to extend it to manage other types of farm and we selected the vineyard as our uh, next uh, use case. Uh, however, when we did that, we, we encountered some challenge. Uh, the first challenge was associated with managing multiple fields. Uh, in, in vineyard farm, a single owner can operate uh, multiple farms. Then we, we, we encountered challenge related to deploy uh, data analytics across different farms uh, using a single uh, control plane. Uh, the second challenge that we encountered was uh, related with the uh, intermittent connectivity. Uh, in the US, most, 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 most farms operate in rural locations that have a poor network connectivity uh, and, and, and failure and, and also uh, uh, power test occur uh, quite often. Then failure is, is the norm for an application de deployed uh, in the farm. The third challenge that we encountered is, was related to, to privacy. And initially, uh, we, we want to expand our framework to, ag to aggregate data from different farms, build a global AI model that can, be, can then be fine-tuned and, and to apply to specific farms. Uh, but we found out that farmers uh, are very concerned about pri privacy and, and, the, and, and the practice of sharing data analytics is not very popular in the farm uh, com community. The, the issues that are listed here uh, are, are very similar to some issues uh, that also encounter in cloud native uh, environment. Uh, more precisely, uh, the user of multi cluster has, be has become um, uh, very common in cloud native environment. For example, it is used to assess heterogeneous sources, like for example, CPU or, spe or spe special hardware. Uh, it is used to, to build the environments to, to address uh, compliance, uh, uh, compliance for, for the enterprise security or, or due to some data governance requirements. In this environment, there is also a need to manage and deploy uh, workloads uh, across uh, clusters. Also in edge computer scenarios, uh, intermittent connectivity, uh, privacy, and security are issues uh, that are relevant for cloud native uh, applications de deployed uh, on the edge. Uh, and to address some of these challenges, uh, multiple solutions uh, um, to manage workloads across multiple, multiple clusters have been proposed, like for example, Kubestellar, uh, Karmada, and OCM. Then it, it became clear, uh, it became very clear to, for our team that to bring na cloud native technologies for our use case in digital agriculture was a, a non natural fit. In, in the next slides, uh, I, would, I would describe uh, how we implement uh, a cloud native uh, framework for data analytics in digital ag agriculture using two uh, technologies that is a software-defined pa paradigm and the cube stellar. But first, let me start by giving you some background on software-defined paradigm and the uh, cube stellar. Software-defined paradigm uh, uh, is software-defined farm is a paradigm for in digital agriculture developed by our uh, collaborators at Cornell University. 
Uh, it consists of a component called Edge Cloud uh, that co collects data from plants and animals at the farm and send that to a remote, uh, a remote or core cloud where the data is, is processed, stored, analyzed, and the results are presented to, to the farmer. And, and this figure here illustrated the end-to-end flow in a software-defined farm uh, paradigm. Uh, start, starting with step one in this picture, we have sensors and networking devices deployed at, at the farm to collect the sensing data from animals and plants and, and transmit that to, to a remote uh, cloud. Uh, that's, that is step two in this, in this figure. At step, at step three, at the core cloud, this data is stored, processed, and the analytics are computing them uh, to, uh, to allow farms to, to make well-informed well and uh, data-driven uh, decisions. At step four, farmers can log into the SDF apl application, a user interface, to visualize the aggregate data uh, and, and, and also trigger some, some uh, action, like for example, trigger irrigation if, if sensors indicate that, that, that there is water stress uh, in, in plants. Uh, next, uh, I'll, I'll provide a background of, of Cube Cube Stellar. And uh, I'm part of the team that is building and maintaining a Cube Stellar. Now, Cube Stellar is a multi-cluster workload management application uh, th that uh, provides you with, the, with the, a single plane of, of glass to configure, de deploy uh, your application and give you the experience of, akin of using just a single cluster. And, and Cube Stellar is a CNSF uh, sand sandbox project. And uh, I would like to invite you to, yeah, to visit our website and, and learn more about uh, this project. But uh, let, me, let me give you here some, uh, some overview of, of Cube Stellar. Uh, Cube Stellar provides uh, abstractions uh, that we call spaces for isolation. Uh, a, a space just behaves like a, a normal Kubernetes cluster. And Cube Stellar uses two types of spaces. Uh, the first space is called Workload Description Space, or WGS. That's the space that the user interacts with and deploy its workload. The second space uh, is, the, is called the inventory or transport space. The, on this space contains the inventory of our cluster. It's, it's also the space where the, the workload de deployed by the user is wrapped, wrapped, uh, wrapped and, the, and the before the distribution to the remote uh, clusters. Kubestel also provides you with the pluggable uh, transport layer to deploy your workload. And, and now we are using a uh, Kube uh, OCM as our uh, plugin now transport layer. With Kube Stellar, you can also uh, customize your de deployed workloads and collect, collect, summarize status, collect and summarize status of, of the workloads deployed uh, at, at the edge. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to just describe the, the workflow of deploying uh, a workload using uh, Cube Stellar. Uh, first, uh, the user will interact with the WDS and deploy its workload on it. And then the user will define a, a bind policy. The, the bind policy spec specifies the, the, the placement of, of, of the workload to the desired remote uh, uh, cluster. Uh, and and the, the, this, this association is done uh, using um, uh, labels. And this corresponds just to step one uh, in this figure. Uh, at, at step two, uh, the, the transport controller will wrap uh, the workload uh, into a contained object, push, push it to, to, to the ETS space, and then the workload is gonna be distributed to the remote cluster. And this corresponds to uh, to steps 3A and 3B in this, in this picture. Uh, lastly, uh, the, the status of the deployed workload uh, is propagated back to, to the WGS and present, to, uh, that, that's the interface that the user uh, interacts with and then present to the user. This corresponds to step uh, three, 3C and 4 in this picture. 
So th th this this conclude uh, then then to end the workflow of, of how you can use a cube styler to to deploy a workload in a remote cluster. Now I'm gonna hand over to Gloa, who who will describe how we use both cube styler and the software defined paradigm to build the, uh, our uh, framework for dig digital analytics analytics at the farm. Thank you, Braulio. So now that we've learned about Kubesteller and the software-defined farm platform that we've built, we try to think about how do we bring them into a single framework that's cloud-native. So the work that I'm going to be showing, it builds partly on uh, some internship work I did with IBM Research, with Bradley being my mentor, where we investigated a clean slate approach for edge work cloud workload management at scale. For example, if you can look at that image, Imagine using uh, like edge computing to deploy a computer vision model update to a million autonomous vehicles, or you can also imagine a menu update to a thousand Chick-fil-A locations. It was only until this project that I learned that Chick-fil-A does use edge computing. Now, when you try to manage those different, uh, different workloads, we produce a paper on it and we try to take those ideas and bring them to the farm. So in this case, instead of autonomous vehicles, or restaurants which are always connected to the internet, like Bradley mentioned, you have connectivity issues. Imagine trying to deliver data analytics model updates to a thousand, like n different farms, where it could be 50 different farms with a thousand cows with 10 sensors each, or it could be 30 vineyards where you have generated terabytes of data from remote sensing that we're going to use to create the models, all with low networking connectivity. So then to ensure that our system design actually matches with day-to-day -day, day -day farm needs, what we did then is we took our IBM collaborators from, the, uh, from like their cozy offices and we brought them to the Dairy Research Center at Cornell early last year. And then I spent last summer talking to some grape growers like managers and vineyard managers in California to get a sense of like what are the actual issues that they face. So then we need to wait, a way then to manage like dairy uh, farms and also vineyards at, at, from a single control plane. Now, to try to deploy the software defined farm on all of those locations, we're going to, to, to do it from a central location that we call the core cloud here, uh, shown in, the, uh, in, in blue. So then to do the deployments, we use a hub and spoke model. The hub and spoke model is quite common in edge workload management, and we built on it on, our, on the paper that we published. So in this case, the hub is a centralized manager in the core cloud, and the spokes that you see at the farms are representing the edge clusters. So then the hub is in charge of delivering the software-defined farm updates to the spokes. So then the spokes at the bottom are going to be managed in the hub by Kubernetes. Now, like an orchestra master, Kubernetes tends to orchestrate different spokes to make them look like they're part of, this, of a single cluster. The only downside is, like an orchestra master, Unlike an orchestra master, that, that is what I meant to say, Kubernetes tend to treat all the resources as if they're the same. But from the 17 months of experience building something for a farm and then trying to extend it to vineyards, we learned that no two farms are the same. So then, what if, for example, we want to deploy some model updates to only the vineyards? Or within a particular vineyard, what if we want to deploy it to only certain devices with a certain operating system like a Raspberry Pi? That's what Kubstella comes in and that's what it does. That is through the Kubstella core in the hub, it enables us to specify exactly where to deliver the updates. So then at the edge, you have the Kubstella agents which then synchronize updates from the hub and they can be assumed that the agents will not always be available on online. So they can be able to be able to operate in a disconnected environment. So then you can think of Kubstella in this case like a post office, that is, I usually agree, I have an agreement with the post office where I will check my mail every, every few days and the post office will deliver any updates that have my label on them. So that's what Kubstella tried to, uh, does in this, in this context. That is to deliver software-defined farm updates to the edge locations. So then, that's the framework. Now how do we implement it? So I'm going to describe the core and how we implemented that and the factors that we considered in our implementation and then the same thing at the edge. So when it comes to the hub, uh, we implemented it using AWS Elastic Kubernetes Service, or EKS. And in trying to anticipate the, net, the, net, the experiments we're going to be running, that is, we deploy updates to the edge, and we try to get a sense of, are they running on those locations? But if you're trying to do this where you get a signal of a running pod from an edge location, from a hub, 
there could be a little bit of a clock skew going on there. So how do we then uh, synchronize the clock skew to make sure we don't have any, uh, a lot of clock skew? So what we did is AWS offers a clock synchronization service. So then we took our edge devices and mapped them to use the synchronization with AWS so that the hub is always so somewhat within the same time frame as the, uh, the, edge, uh, the edge locations. So that's how we implemented the hub. Now, when it comes to the edge locations, they're implemented using K3S, and we chose K3S for three reasons. First, K3S is intended for devices with limited processing power and storage. In our case, such de devices were the Raspberry Pis. And as you have heard, we may have heard from DP, the CEO of Suzy this morning in the keynote, K3S is quite lightweight. That is, it's a self-contained process with a memory footprint that's quite low, approximately 70 megabytes. And then third, in a recent paper that was done by Koziolik and Eskadani, they did a comparison between the different lightweight versions of Kubernetes to see which ones are the best. And when it comes to pod creation latency, K3S seemed to be having a really good performance, so that's how we, why we chose it. So now we have the hub, which is AWS, and we have the spokes, which are using K3S. Kubestella then is going to be delivering, delivering updates to those locations. So then now we think about the data path. That's the control path. For the data path, that's where the software-defined farm, or SDF, comes in. So the SDF is going to support the application logic, and it is implemented as follows. That is, the SDF exposes an API where application clients can be able to communicate with the servers located in the cloud, and then you can see them shown with the, the orange paths here. The way that we designed the SDF was intended to be vendor agnostic. What that means is we do not want to be tied to a particular cloud provider when it comes to data storage or processing or any other, other uh, task that we need to do. So then in this case, you can see here that we're pulling images for an image processing application at the edge with remote sense data that we've pre-processed and put in DynamoDB and S3 so then the server is getting that data on behalf of the client and doing the processing at the edge. In essence then, the SDF gives us a plug and play framework so that we can be able to make updates to the application logic without too much changes in the API. With that in mind, we have the data path. So then the control path is provided by Kubesteller. That is, as you can see, it, it's shown here in the blue path where Kubesteller is in charge of overseeing the management of the updates. Let me, let me make this concrete. That is, consider that, for example, we have a new data source that's come, coming online for a new sensor vendor. So then how do we integrate that new data source into the, the SDF to serve some, some of our applications that need that data source? So what we would do is we simply make the application logic changes, and then we can use Kubesteller to immediately deploy those updates to the, to the edge locations. And then you can have the case where if you just create two namespaces, you'll have one namespace where the Kubestella core is running to deliver the updates, and then you have another namespace where the SDF server is running to deliver those data back to, uh, back to the application. So that's the implementation of the, of the framework. To evaluate this framework now, we deployed it on the hardware prototype shown here, where the hub that I just told you about with AWS, it's running in a data center in Virginia which AWS also calls East, uh, US East 2. And then on the edge, we have Raspberry Pis that represent vineyards. That is two vineyards in this case, shown on the left and right. And then my laptop represents a dairy farm running on a virtual machine that, that is Ubuntu. In terms of metrics, we're interested in three aspects of evaluating our framework. First, we want to under understand, is there variance in deploying to different hardware architectures or operating systems? So here we measured the end-to-end -end latency of requests to deploy new updates to those edge locations. Secondly, does the framework scale well when you have contention between multiple clients? So there, there we measured the end-to-end -end latency of client requests when you have multiple clients hitting the same server pod. And then third, how easy is it for us to be able to enroll a new cluster by deploying a Kubesteller agent on the cluster? So now it's part of our, uh, our uh, reachable clusters. So this was more of a qualitative evaluation. Now, given the limited amount of time that I have, we're going to be focusing on the workload update latency. That is the first metric. But you can ask me about the other aspects uh, in the Q&A or offline. So when it comes to the update latency, we wanted to minimize the update latency. That is, the experiment we ran was as follows. That is, we repeatedly created 50 consecutive pod where we create the pod, we push it to the hub, the hub pushes it to the edge, 
the edge reports the pod as running on all those locations. Now we have that as a, uh, like a running pod. We know it's been deployed. We delete it, and then we repeat the process 50 times to try to get a sense of what is the latency to create those pods. Now, we computed the latency then as the difference between when the pod is shown as created on the hub and when it's shown as running on the edge locations. So that's the difference that we're, I'm talking about here. Now, when it comes to the figure that I'm showing you here, the x-axis is going to represent the different devices that I just showed you in the implementation. That is the two Raspberry Pis and one uh, virt virtual machine. Because we wanted to get a sense of, does the hardware architecture matter? Does the operating system matter? And what we observe is that lower numbers here are going to be better. So what that means is we observe that on average, it takes about 15 seconds to de deploy those updates. Now, 15 seconds is the number that you can interpret multiple ways, but I would like to give you two uh, concrete ways that we saw it. With the 15 seconds, what that means is it's the time that the, the pod is deployed, but includes deploying the, the, like the manifest to say, deploy this pod. It's the time to pull the image and then to start running the pod itself. So compared to this, the, the paper that Koziolek and Eskadani published, where they said it was taking them seven seconds to create a pod, you have to think about hours we have to create the image and we have to sort of go coast to coast to get those updates. But for them, the pods that they were created, were, they were using within the same data center that is an Azure data center. The second conclusion that we can draw from this is that in the context of the software-defined farm, before we started to expand to multiple locations, it used to take us 24 hours to, if you want to create a new update. Because I have to talk to my friend Martin, who's on the farm, tell him, hey, I need a new update. I need to send this to the farm. Can you check that, the, like, is the connectivity good? Is the machine running? Are we able to deploy this? But now we've deployed it and we're able to use Kubesteller. We've gone from 24 hours deployment to about 15 seconds because it has less uh, human feedback in the loop. Now, if you can think about it, then we can be able to deploy a new pod and send it to the vineyards only or send it to the dairy management uh, only. So our design then and implementation that I just talked to you about of this framework provides a few lessons learned and benefits that we've observed. The first one is that you've observed that we're able to, we're enabling farms to stay operational even during uh, connection, uh, like disconnected, uh, disconnected operations, even when you don't, have, you don't have good network connectivity. We've gained a better understanding of privacy concerns because we're scaling. We have to think about privacy for the farmers in the digital agriculture space because we're trying to use cloud native technologies. And then third, we've been able to empower, as you can see in this figure, we've empowered vineyard stakeholders with timely insights, such as evapotranspiration over a given season. So this was the season in 2020 where you can see the evapotranspiration go up and down. With these kind of insights, I can be able to then irrigate and come up with good irrigation strategies for the following season. With these lessons in mind, then I will pass it back to my colleague Braulio to conclude the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Gloa. So uh, in this talk, uh, yeah, we, we present uh, a, hub, a hub and spoke uh, platform that can help you to do uh, uh, analytics using cloud native technologies in digital farm. And we showed the implementation of, of, of our platform using uh, Cube Stellar and the software defined para paradigm. As, as a next step, yeah, we, we plan to, to deploy uh, this platform in, in a uh, farm, in the production farm in California. And we also plan to expand, to expand our platform uh, to better address the, the privacy concern of the farmers uh, by, by creating features that, that can enable uh, the, the creation of privacy preserving uh, AI model data training uh, and sharing across farms. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, the end of our talk. Uh, thank you. Now we are open for questions. I believe this is supposed to be free. <laughs> I may have missed this, but what was it that made you decide to go with vineyards for uh, the second aspect of the project? So for the second aspect, when we, we began with the dairy management, this was like early on in my PhD, but then I, I was part of a program at Cornell called the National Research Traineeship in Digital Plant Science, where I was collaborating with somebody where you bring engineers and plant scientists together to see what they can do. 
And then in this case, they had collaborators in the vineyard space, and uh, they had some really interesting challenges there that they wanted to solve, and that's why we sort of forayed into that space. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know in agriculture that, uh, like, you've selected cows, you've selected the vineyards. You haven't talked about, um, like, wheat or traditional cereal crops, where I know there's a lot of proprietary seeds and, and is this something that is applicable to that kind of industry? Like, do you see working with, like, some of the, agri the agricultural companies behind those, or is that not where you're interested in? Yes, um, I think for for those spaces, we, we have like the next phase of the project is like we talked about the privacy concerns. We have to think about where some of the companies are interested in developing models, but they're they're concerned about their IP like the seed like you just talked about. That's something they would like to be able to maintain as private. So then we're trying to develop a compute space where they bring in their IP, we bring in the farm's data, but the farm's data is not available to them either. We develop a model together and then hopefully prov provide some insights to all parties concerned without revealing anybody, anybody's data. So that's the next phase of the project that some PhD students at Cornell are working on with uh, Braulio and Andy from the Kubstellar team. Hi, thank you. Awesome talk. Um, I'm new to edge computing, so I'm curious, when you say K3S, that is creating its own cluster on the cow's neck then? Or I guess I'm, you know, I'm curious why it's its own cluster and not just another node on your whole cluster. Yeah, so uh, would you like to? No, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so the way that we set up the K3S is you can think of Kubstellar being like a control plane within a control plane. So we have the cluster running at the farm to collect data from multiple sources, like from data coming from the different sensors. But the cluster itself is we deploy the, the Kubstellar agent on it, and then we point the Kubstellar agent to its server in the core cloud. That's how we're able to deliver those updates. So in this case, it's like we're doing multi-cluster, but Kubstellar is what allows us to bring those new clusters online. And uh, uh, Andy? And yes. No, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to add to that. So a node in Kubernetes goes offline if a node in Kubernetes goes offline if it can't be reached for 40 seconds straight. So at most of these farms, they have dial-up. They're not online consistently. So if we did a node in a regular Kubernetes cluster, we'd lose connection and then couldn't schedule a job. Right. So that's why Kubestellar is good at that. It handles and tolerates indefinite this connection. Okay. So in, in addition to that, we are now affirming to be scalable. Uh, and and the, in Kubernetes, you know, there is a limitation how, how, how many nodes you should attach to a single Kubernetes cluster. Appreciate it. Great question so far. We're loving this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I guess we must answer yeah, everybody. We have, we have one more question. One more. Okay. So kind of on the same thing, I'm guessing you're using certificates for part of your auth in your Kubestellar. Um, I might be wrong, but if you're using certificates, say like for some reason my node went offline for, you know, three months, and then I try and bring it back online, like, you know, so, you know, say a hurricane hit my area, um, and I'm offline for that long, and I try and bring it back online, and that cert, like, I still want all my data, right? I was collecting it privately, or whatever I could during that time. Um, how do I get it back online after that? Uh, so, the, in the farm, so, it, each cluster is going to have a Kubestella uh, agent that connects to the remote cluster that has the certificate. If this certificate has expired, you're going to have to get the, the new certificate and just uh, yeah, uh, restart the Kubestella agent. But, and then all the data that you have in your cl cluster will, will be propagated and sent to, to, to the core. Basically, I just need to, yeah, to restart the Kubestella agent with, with the valid certificate. Uh, do you have any uh, further questions? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. thank you all yeah, for thank you everyone. Yeah, for, yeah, for joining this talk. Appreciate it.